Good evening to all of you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Ramarao for inviting me every year. And uh, there is a great danger in inviting me because I never say no. Uh, and, uh, uh, one of the difficulties in coming every year is you are not very sure whether there are any members in the audience from the previous year and whether they remember what you said the previous year. So I have tried every time to prepare a new lecture on a subject which is of some interest to me. This year when Dr. Ramarao asked me to come, I thought I would talk about a subject which uh, I have been thinking about and that is simply the fact that chemistry is such a vast subject and the chemistry that drives biology is sometimes so vast that it is difficult to in fact understand all of it. But my first slide is a new slide which I made only day before yesterday and it took me a little while to make this. I thought there might be some young students who are uh, uh, fond of going to the internet. But if you go to the internet and go to the Chemical Abstract Services website, you will find this counter. This counter is the number of substances or molecules which have now been indexed in chemical abstracts. So continuously every day more substances are added so this counter will keep on ticking. So if you look at the slide you will find that I have snapped the counter at 1020 and my student has then helped me to snap it again at 1025. And in five minutes, you can see that we have added 46 more substances. If you go to Delhi, there is a board somewhere at one of the busy traffic intersections which will tell you what is the population of India and that board will constantly be changing. They are not actually measuring the population but they have some idea of the growth so somebody has adjusted the population clock to keep on increasing. Now you can see that we are adding 46 substances here in 5 minutes and yesterday I was thinking that it would be interesting to do this experiment, it doesn't cost anything to do this experiment, at different times in the day and ask the question whether there is a peak in the day, whether there is a peak in the day of the week, uh, does it change more on uh, Fridays as compared to Saturdays and Sundays and so forth. There are many questions that one might ask. Now the question you must ask when you look at this number is, is this a large number or a small number? Now if I read this number, it is actually 6.7 crores now. And 6.7 crores now in India has become a small number because the financial scams are now sometimes 50 times this. So we have become used now to thinking in terms of crores, of large numbers of crores. In fact, if you add a 1 in front of this, you will get 167 crores, so I think we have to add uh, more. Uh, and that would mean that we have almost reached the 2G kind of uh, levels. But chemistry is still a long way away from doing this, but this is still a very large number of substances. The next three slides that I'm going to show you are slides which I showed last year when I spoke about the richness of chemistry in the International Year of Chemistry. The first question of course is what, if you go back and look at this, you find substances here. Now what are these substances? Substances are molecules and we need to define chemicals and molecules. Two years ago, the Bombay High Court gave this judgment that steam is not a chemical. But steam is just water in the vapor phase and therefore we know that water is a chemical, therefore steam must be a chemical. But the Bombay High Court took a different view because they were trying to tax steam as opposed to water and they have in fact uh, given all these uh, this judgment in a very careful way, they've actually said that chemistry can be violated certainly by the law, but the law, law cannot be violated by chemistry. Now, everything around you is a chemical. Anything you touch is in fact a chemical. There's nothing which is not a chemical or a substance. And therefore, the Royal Society of Chemistry has offered a prize which will never be won by anybody because they've offered one million pounds to anyone who provides a sample of a material which is free of chemicals. 
Now, the reason why everyone is looking for something free of chemicals is chemicals and chemistry are associated with toxic substances. What people fail to realize is that chemicals are there everywhere and you are also just a collection of chemicals. And since you're living and you're a biological object, uh, it is then worthwhile to ask questions about the chemistry in biology and the chemistry in life. If one talks about chemicals, we are really talking about molecules. And I'm going to have just two very simple slides to illustrate the idea of atoms. When I put this slide day before yesterday, I did not realize that this slide would become so important today. Because there are, this and the next slide tell you the difference between physics and chemistry. This slide now, tells you the two most important events which happened in our understanding of atoms. The first was Rutherford's idea of an atom with a nucleus with electrons around it. The second was Bohr's slightly more elaborate description of how the electrons really moved with respect to the nucleus and therefore generated many of the properties of atoms, the spectroscopic properties of atoms. But, but physicists really are concerned very much with the nucleus. Whereas, chemistry is largely concerned with what the electrons do in molecules. Now, of course, you will find the physicists are really concerned with the nucleus, and yesterday, or this morning's newspaper, is full of the God particle. Now, yesterday, uh, I was besieged by uh, telephone calls from the press, asking me what did I think about the God particle. Now, the press is unable to understand that the director of the Indian Institute of Science might be just as ignorant about the God particle as anybody else because it is a very esoteric area of uh, physics and it is only those physicists who are interested in the ultimate structure of the nucleus, in the ultimate particles which give mass to other particles, who will in fact be able to answer these questions. Now if you turn around and ask me, uh, what is the Higgs boson, then of course I will have to give an answer that I do not know. Now I was afraid of giving this answer because the next day it will appear in the paper that the director of the Indian Institute of doesn't, uh, doesn't even know this. Uh, so it's very dangerous nowadays to actually be a scientist because you're expected to know the answer, especially an administrator of science, because then you're expected to know the answer to everything. And most administrators don't know the answer to most things. And that is in fact fact. So I'm going to stick to what I know and I'm going to talk to you about molecules. Molecules, there are only two ideas which are important in chemistry, which is required by anybody. Molecules are nothing but atoms connected to one another. And the ways in which atoms are connected to one another was first enunciated by uh, G. N. Lewis, where he talked about electrons holding atoms together in forming chemical bonds. Some years later in the 1920s and 1930s, Linus Pauling elaborated this idea of atoms and molecules and the uh, molecular structure of all kinds of substances. And we then became aware that molecules have three-dimensional shapes. And if you look at atoms as hard balls, then they can be connected in many, many different ways in order to generate very complex three-dimensional objects. The only problem with these objects, as I will show you, is that the objects themselves are so small that you can't see them directly. But otherwise, you can, in fact, relate them to most of the objects that you might see around you. But let's go back to biology now. I have noticed over the years that uh, the composition of the audience in the Bangalore Science Forum is largely people who are beyond a certain age. Some years ago, I used to feel, say 20 years ago or 30 years ago when I used to come to the Bangalore Science Forum, I used to feel significantly younger than the members of the audience. And I was rather happy. Now I've noticed as time has gone on, I now have a kinship with the members of the audience. And so I now know the kinds of things that concern older people. It turns out that of all the subjects of science, the one which interests people as they age is biology. And the reason is they begin to feel their biology fading. And very often their biology fails them. 
and they are then worried because this now leads to clinical problems, it leads to medical problems and at the heart of medicine is of course the problems of biology. So if you look at the human body itself, you can immediately decompose now the human body into a collection of organs and that's what I have done on the slide uh, vertically where I have listed the main organs with which all of you are familiar with. You're familiar with the brain, heart, lung, liver, kidney. But if you then ask the question, what are they composed of? They are then of course composed of cells. Cells get together to form tissue and tissue now has various shapes and functions like in the brain or the heart and they are extremely specialized functions. In fact, today the brain is probably the organ which is being maximally studied. And I noticed that in the program of lectures that you have, one of my colleagues, who was in fact a solid state chemist, is now talking about the brain. And I'm sure the reason is that as he has grown older, he has become more and more conscious. Because when you get older, you suddenly find that your memory is failing you. Now you know something, we can't remember it. Now the question is, why can't you remember it? What's happened? Now, there is obviously a failure of the cellular chemistry which is responsible for memory. Sometimes you can't see, uh, sometimes you're not able to move your limbs in the manner in which you want to move them. Therefore, the chemistry of the body is in fact dictated in many ways by the various interactions between the molecules of which we are all composed. Now, the cell, of course, is the fundamental unit of biology. If you ask what is the fundamental unit of uh, chemistry, a chemist will say, well, if I understand the hydrogen atom, then I can in fact extrapolate to all the other atoms. And this is what we do when you solve the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom explicitly and then use approximate methods to look at all the heavier atoms. So the hydrogen atom in some way exemplifies chemistry. The rest of the periodic table is really built, which I talked about last year, is built by expanding from the hydrogen atom. If you ask what is the hydrogen atom of biology, the hydrogen atom of biology will be a living cell. So living cells will come in different shapes, they will have different functions, but they are then little bags which are full of chemicals and they are very complex chemistry, what we call biochemistry or biological chemistry, is in fact practiced by the cell. This is chemistry over which you have no control. And although you have no control over this chemistry, you must be amazed at the fact that this chemistry works so well. Billions of us manage quite well for long periods of time without ever thinking about what our biochemistry is actually doing. We worry about it only when it fails. We hardly worry about it when it succeeds because we take it now for granted. But if I look at a cell in cross-section, that is what it would look like, so I simply slice the piece of it, there will be lots of other things, and inside the cell there will be smaller objects. This, for example, is what is called an organelle. So you can see those are organs, these are cells, and inside the cell there are what are called organelles. They are also little bags. The bags are bounded by a membrane, just the way a milk packet holds the milk inside with a plastic membrane around it. These membranes are semi-permeable. Molecules can go in and out, but only some molecules can go in and out, so there is control of the traffic of chemicals in and out of cells. But if you look at the structure very carefully, you will find that it looks just like a bacterial cell. I forgot to put a picture of a bacterial cell there, but a bacterium is a unicellular organism, so there's just one cell. It looks just like a mitochondria. So long, long ago, our cells have actually symbiotically incorporated a bacterium, which has eventually evolved into a mitochondria. But what does the mitochondrion do? It is in this region of the cell that some of the most important metabolic processes happen. The process of respiration, by which when you breathe, the oxygen is utilized, in fact, and the process of burning of substrate or burning of food is done, this metabolic process which is called oxidative phosphorylation and which generates energy in your cells actually happens in this organelle. So the cell itself is like a chemical factory, an extremely sophisticated chemical factory, and inside the cell there are smaller units which are independent modular factories of their own which are doing things.
But then I have a very specially made this slide for you. If you go into a chemistry department or into a lecture hall in a college where chemistry classes are conducted, what do you expect to find hanging on the wall? You'll find a periodic table. Now the wonderful thing about the periodic table is that everybody looks at it and then doesn't give it a second thought and moves on. But the periodic table is really the core of chemistry. If one understands the periodic table and one works with the periodic table in mind, then I think one in fact has an affinity for chemistry. This is biochemistry's equivalent of the periodic table. This is a chart which will be found hanging in the walls of all biochemistry departments. Today no student looks at it because students don't look at anything other than computer screens. And on a computer screen you can look at this very well, but unfortunately there are so many other things that you can look at on computer screens that they usually don't come to this. So the student who helped me to make this two days ago saw it for the first time himself. And I explained this to him as we made the slides, and now I'm going to explain it to you. Can you read anything of this? Nothing. Can you read anything if you go closely? Nothing. What does it really indicate? The little things which are there are the names of chemicals. And they are the names of chemicals which are being converted by chemical reactions into other chemicals. There is an extraordinary diversity of chemicals over here. And they are all important for your cells to actually function. Every arrow which connects one piece of letters to another letter is a chemical reaction which must now be finely controlled. Now if you go to any of our manufacturing industries, which may be manufacturing what you think is the most sophisticated piece of, maybe manufacturing a, uh, a motor car, maybe manufacturing a computer, maybe manufacturing very complicated printed circuit boards, you will find that all that complexity really fades by comparison with the complexity that you see in the biochemistry of cells. The interconnections here are incredible. This is what is today called a network of chemical reactions. And the word network now has really been adopted from electrical engineering. And today there is a field which is developing called systems biology. I think later on you will in fact have a young man from the National Center for Biological Sciences talking about this. But this is a developing interdisciplinary field that computer scientists, electrical engineers, physicists uh, and others are all coming into biology to really understand this kind of incredible complexity. But even more than complexity, there is control. Control is a word which is so frequently used in electrical engineering. And then there is the problem, for example, in power networks of failure. So you must build redundancy. So if something fails, something else must take over. That kind of redundancy has been built so many times over in biology that even if something fails, you don't even know about it because some other step, some other pathway has actually taken over. How can this is what is called intermediary metabolism or cellular chemistry? What is very interesting is, some two years ago, Harvard University in its undergraduate biochemistry syllabus finally decided to remove the study of intermediary metabolism. This is because this is old. This has come from the 19th century all the way to the, to the first half of the 20th century, and therefore it must be replaced by things which are much newer. But what, in this kind of change of syllabus, what has not been really appreciated is that this entire field is actually now coming back. It's coming back in a big way with the entry of people into the field who are no longer classical biochemists, but they have come in from other fields. And they are not afraid of the kind of complexity that you see here and believe that this complexity can in fact be analyzed. But in order to show you a comparison, I have a map here. On the side is the Bangalore traffic map. I just downloaded it from the internet. Now if I ask you the question, which one looks more complicated, you will say that one looks more complicated. It might look more complicated, but that is because the Bangalore map is, complete, is not at all complete. Most of the streets are left out. So all the little streets which have no names, or the names are known only to the people who live on the street, 
are all left out on these maps. And if you put every little street into it, this will also be a maze of connections. Now here you will understand the importance of networks, of the importance of rerouting. Now if you cut off every road when you're uh, building the metro, you might actually cut off one part of the city from the other, which is not possible. And therefore you must find ways of diverting the traffic. That kind of approach is exactly what nature does with its chemistry. There are diversions, there are shunts. It's the language really of the traffic management. Except that what is being managed there is cellular chemistry's traffic. If I now zoom in on that map, I will find that if I expand it and just look at one small portion, I'll find the arrows, I'll find the structures of molecules, and one molecule going to the other. And if you look along the horizontal line here, going from here to here, I've just taken a few steps in a pathway which is called glycolysis in the cell. Glycolysis is the process by which glucose, with which all of you are familiar, is metabolized to give you energy. Glucose metabolism gives you energy. Glucose metabolism, when it doesn't work properly, gives you diabetes. Glucose is, of course, essential. So you will find these drinks advertised, glucon D and all, and you will find a very tired looking child after one uh, round of glucon D is back on the field playing and winning a match or something. And in all those, the moral really is that glucose provides energy. The way glucose provides energy is that it is broken down. And this is the way all carbohydrates which you eat are in fact broken down. And you need the sequence of reactions at every point producing energy-rich molecules. So chemistry here is coupled. That is, the energy of a chemical reaction can be utilized to store the energy in a molecule. The energy which is stored in a molecule can then be recovered again. Rather the way in which we store energy in a battery and then recover it again and then recharge the battery once more. But these are processes which are going on continually. They cannot stop. They continue as long as you are around and functioning. If you look at the pathway in somewhat greater detail, this is how the pathway will go and you will produce energy as you carry out all these chemical reactions. But you can ask a question about the molecule. How many carbon atoms are there in glucose? There are six carbon atoms in glucose. Now as you go down, you will come to a step where the glucose molecule will be broken and three carbon atoms will go that way and three carbon atoms will go that way. Which means you have taken six carbon atoms, you have burnt the molecule, and you have now produced two halves, one which contains three carbon atoms, the other which contains three more carbon atoms. This burning of carbon, which I use as a metaphor, is exactly what you do when you burn coal. Now all this problem that you have about uh, global warming, climate change, carbon dioxide and so on, is simply because if you burn carbon, you oxidize carbon. And if you oxidize carbon, you will produce carbon dioxide. You produce carbon dioxide, you go up into the atmosphere. And atmospheric carbon dioxide levels will go up, go up. But the cell doesn't do it quite that way. The cell, in fact, uses the carbon in a more uh, intelligent manner. And it now has taken six carbons, broken them into two pieces with three each. And this piece of three will go further on producing the energy. In this case, this piece of three atoms is now not useful for producing energy. But it can be used for producing other molecules as I will show you in a minute. But there will be a reaction which actually interconverts these. If you look at the structures of the two molecules here, you will find they have exactly the same number of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen if you count. So you can count all the C's, all the H's, all the O's. They're exactly, the, they're what the chemist would call isomers. Now, of course, you will have an enzyme, which is a catalyst, which is a protein, which will simply carry out this interconversion. This is carefully controlled. When the cell needs energy, it will go in this direction, and when the cell needs other molecules where it needs the carbon atom, it will go away in that direction. So this is a very carefully controlled enzyme. I found the nice this here. If you burn glucose, that's the metabolic process, you produce energy. You go this way, this is the process, the biochemical process called glycolysis. 
But if you now make a molecule which does not go into this, three of the carbon atoms are here, you can use this to make other molecules, you can build molecules. This is what is called biosynthesis. You would need this because your cells, for example, have fat in them. Fat again contains many carbon atoms. Where will this fat come from? This fat will have actually have to come by biosynthesis. So when you think about biochemistry, remember that the historical origins of biochemistry are firmly rooted in nutrition. It is nutrition which provides you the chemical materials which allow you to continually regenerate what you have lost and to be able to make the molecules, the cells and the tissues. We now lose millions of cells every day when we have a bath. We lose hair every day. We lose everything every day. There is only one organ in the body where I think we add very little after we are born and we only lose as we go along and that's the brain. And what is amazing with the brain is of the enormous capacity of the brain we use only a fraction of it throughout our lives and as we age we slowly lose even that fraction to neurodegenerative processes. So there is still the brain is capable of much greater things than it has actually achieved uh, so far. That in fact is the evolution of our human beings themselves. And the reaction that I told you is what a biochemist would call an enzyme catalyzed reaction. And the enzyme is nothing but a complicated molecule which will quickly do this. The physicist would view this as, say, a Maxwellian demon, which will simply strip an atom from there, an atom from there, and stick it back on some other place. But the enzyme, of course, will do this, allowing all the laws of chemistry to be followed. Now, enzymes are large molecules. They are what one calls macromolecules. So, organic chemistry, for example, is concerned with small molecules. Biochemistry is concerned with large molecules and also small molecules. So there isn't any real difference in the chemistry themselves, except that all these proteins which we have, they are produced by a mechanism which involves genetic encoding. So the message is encoded in DNA, which is converted into proteins. So genetics really is the study of DNA, the message, and its translation, finally, into these protein structures. Techniques which have come from physics allow us to study these, like X-ray diffraction allows us to study these, which are little machines. But it turns out that when there are problems with these machines, you have disease. I unfortunately forgot to put a picture of the organism Drosophila. Drosophila is nothing but a fruit fly. If you just leave the bananas outside for a little while, you'll find the little flies hovering around them. Those are Drosophila, and they have been the objects of study by biologists now for almost 100 years. They are very, very powerful tools for studying genetics. Some time ago, a fly, which was a mutant fly, was isolated, in which was paralyzed early, which underwent neurodegeneration and early death. Now this is something very interesting because as human beings live longer and longer, thanks to advances in medicine, we are now encountering a new set of problems. In fact, sometimes it worries you that if you live very long, you are inevitably going to encounter some problem or the other down the line. You have to. Now the problem that is being encountered increasingly in the West and has also come to India is neurodegeneration. So you hear of more cases of Alzheimer's disease, more cases of various kinds of senile dementia, and as a consequence is really degeneration of the cells in the brain. So this would then become a model for study, so one can ask the question, what are the changes that have taken place here, and use this as a model for studying human disease. But when this happens, it turns out that the disease really affects this change, this nutritional change, affects this chemical reaction. Instead of the reaction going in this direction, the reaction goes in a different direction. And you produce a substance called methyl dioxide, which is an extremely toxic molecule. This is what a chemist would call a dicarbonyl compound, that it has two CO groups, therefore it's very, very reactive. 
And if it's very reactive, if you produce very reactive molecules inside the body, they will react with other molecules and cause damage. This is the kind of damage that you see in diabetes. If you ask a question about diabetes, it turns out in diabetes you have elevated glucose levels. So what happens when you have elevated glucose levels is you are simply being cooked with glucose for at 37 degrees, which is body temperature, for long periods of time if your sugar levels are uncontrolled. You can ask the question, what happens when you cook proteins with glucose? This question actually is the easiest answer if you go to the kitchen. Because many times when you're making uh, uh, chocolate and things with milk and boiling the milk and putting lots of sugar into it and uh, after a little while what happens? You get a browning of the sugars. After all chocolate it eventually looks uh, nice and brown. Now effectively what you're doing is you're putting the proteins there with the sugar that you have added and sometimes when you see this you're worried about what's happening to the proteins inside you as it gets cooked with uh, glucose. Now, diabetes, many of the problems that you get with diabetes are really problems that you get when you have with advancing age. Diabetes can sometimes be viewed as just accelerated aging. So whether it is renal failure or cardiac problems, they come earlier to diabetics than they come to people who have had extremely well-controlled sugar. But when you think about diabetes, you might actually think about a problem. It's actually a chemical disease. It's a chemical reaction. The chemical, the, the deleterious modification of proteins happens because of the glucose. If one understands molecular structures, one can understand the changes in these machines which are taking place when you have disease, how far apart are they from the active part of the molecule. This is rather like troubleshooting a machine when it stops working. And you can then ask the question, which component is really at fault? How far is it? Wow, how can it be now repaired? It turns out, of course, with molecules, repair is very difficult, unlike a man-made machine. In terms of size, these molecules which I have talked about, like enzymes, actually are about 45 angstrom, if you look at a sphere, and one angstrom is about 10 to the minus 10 of a meter. So these are not objects that you can see with the eye, but they are objects which biochemists and structural biologists can see in crystals using X-ray diffraction and in solution using spectroscopy. That told you a little bit about the complexity of the chemistries that one encounters. But now I will show you a problem with which I am working. And the problem is a problem of biology. The problem of biology is just this, that you have organisms in the sea. These are marine snails. And if you look at the snails, the snails can't really move very fast. But they need to eat. Now how can they eat if they can't move? Or what do they eat? They eat worms, they eat fishes, and they might eat other small mollusks. And if they cannot move, the other things will get away from them. The only way they can eat well is if they develop an offensive weapon which immobilizes the prey. So this is a classic example of predator-prey relationships in biology. So what this snail has actually developed is a machinery which allows you to inject toxic molecules into fishes or into worms which immobilizes them and then it can move very slowly towards them, capture them and eat them. Why are we interested in this? You might be interested in this just because it happens to be there, it's a phenomenon of nature and one might like to study it much in the way the physicists study the Higgs boson. Except that the physicists spend a lot more money studying the Higgs boson than you would spend uh, in studying a problem like this. And I'll tell you why it is useful. Now all over the world there are about 500 species of cone snails and India has a large coast and about 70 to 80 of them actually lie off the coast of India. Now snails are very very old animals, they've been there for longer than human beings, uh, 50 million years, maybe more, and as a consequence they have evolved over time. And one of the things that evolution has done is to evolve fairly sophisticated chemistry. In fact, the process of evolution really is the process of evolution of chemistry. Biological evolution is not possible without chemical evolution. 
So one can now find in space lots of molecules which may be of use to us. And that's why these are important. But to study these, I would simply summarize this by saying that there are many snails and there are many molecules, and so therefore there's a lot of work for biochemists to do. But it's also an interesting problem to study, because if you go and collect snails, you can go to the beach. And then uh, my colleague, Professor Krishnan, who is at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research here at the National Center for Biological Sciences, is the one who actually started this project. So he goes around the coast of India, uh, he makes friends with all the fishermen, you can see him standing there with the fishermen, then he collects the snails, and you can see that he's a very happy man. He's a very happy and he's a healthy man because he's outdoors most of the time. And uh, I found this quotation in, on the internet from Robert Louis Stevenson which says that it is perhaps a more fortunate destiny to have a taste for collecting shells than to be a millionaire. But what Robert Louis Stevenson did not realize at the time is that the molecules which come from snails do have a potential actually to make people into millionaires. Not by selling the shells, but by actually isolating the molecules and eventually using them in the pharmaceutical industry as drugs. Now there are several molecules which are being looked at in the United States. One of them has actually gone into clinical use, it's been approved in both Europe and the US. And these now act on specific receptors in the central nervous system of human beings. Because see, one of the things is, if they're going to paralyze fishes, there's a target in the fish. A similar target will also be there in human beings because we've all evolved a common chemistry. Now, if we want to modulate the actions of the receptors in our brains and in our central nervous systems, we're looking for molecules which will target them. And therefore, this is a starting point, and that's what has been done in America and in Europe. The reason for this is that if you look at the mechanisms of nerve signaling, a nerve cell will signal to another nerve cell via electrical and chemical signals. But at what is called the synaptic junction, where the two cells don't touch, but there's a little bit of water, you know, this is rather like a cork strait between uh, India and uh, Sri Lanka, or the Indian channel which separates different from the continent of Europe. You have to swim across it. What will swim across it? It will be only molecules. But if they swim across it, they must be recognized as something on the other side, which will be more. And that is the entire mechanism of chemical signaling which takes place. The electrical signal which passes through the nerve cell is converted into a chemical signal, and again from a chemical signal to an electrical signal, and therefore there is this wonderful combination of uh, charge transfer and chemistry which actually controls everything that you do. If you're seeing this slide, this is what is happening. If you're just living, this is what is happening all the time. If you interfere with this, you're in trouble. This is why when you get uh, sometimes stung by something, you get stung by a scorpion, you get stung by, uh, you get uh, bitten by a snake, there is intense pain. And because we are secreting all these molecules into you. But at the same time, the molecules can be turned around to become painkillers if you make them block the pain receptors. And that is where the interest in these molecules really is. This is the apparatus which biology has evolved. A venom gland where the venom is produced, a duct, and then this bulb will squeeze the venom in the duct out, coat a structure which looks just like a harpoon. In there is old English novel of the previous, of the 19th century, Moby Dick, where you will kill whales. There the sailors will coat, the whalers will coat harpoons and then shoot them into whales. It exactly looks the way we had harpoons, except that it's on a very small scale. So if you now get these little animals out and extract the venom glands, you can then do chemistry. You can isolate the venom from these and ask the question, what are the molecules present? But when you ask such questions, you need to separate all that mixture of molecules. And now I will just digress for a moment to keep your attention. Those of you who read about Ayurveda, those of you who read about traditional medicine, will always know that 
The remedies which are there are remedies which have come from nature. They are decoctions of various kinds, ointments of various kinds, all kinds of preparations of various kinds which have been made from plants. Question is, what is present in them? You will immediately know that there is a rich chemistry which is present in them and there will be hundreds and thousands of molecules present in them. So the biological action, the medical efficacy of these preparations will all be determined by the chemical composition. But they are extremely complicated mixtures. So how do we analyze them? We need technologies which allow us to separate the molecules and analyze them. But technologies come along and in the most recent times a technology called mass spectrometry which I discussed some couple of years ago has in fact come along but I wanted to show you just one picture. This is a method which only measures the masses of molecules and identifies them. Now if you measure the masses of molecules and identify them you can identify anything from anywhere. This is a paper which I saw which I like. A meteorite fell 40 years ago called the Murchison meteorite. And now you want to ask what molecules are present because you want to know what molecules are there outside the earth. And if there are extraterrestrial molecules which bear the signature of biology, then of course there might be extraterrestrial life somewhere. Uh, today we have lost our imagination. But when I was young and the Americans were just entering uh, space exploration, everybody thought that by the turn of the century we would have gone to other planets and so all of us when we were young were reading science fiction, imagining the strangest of creatures uh, uh, living on other planets. Uh, today's uh, students are uh, much less imaginative because I think the internet has completely killed your imagination because you can just see whatever you want on it. Measuring molecules, the masses, is just measuring the masses of atoms because every atom has a different mass as you go down the periodic table. So if you connect atoms into molecules, they will have different masses. So you can very easily do this. All you have to do is to take molecules into the gas phase, measure their masses, and this kind of technology is now available. Nobel Prize was given a few years ago to John Fenn for developing these methods. And his title of his lecture was very nice, Electroscrew Wings for Molecular Elephants. So since it's a gas-based measurement, all you have to do is to make the molecule fly. So just like Walt Disney gave uh, Dumbo the flying elephant a pair of wings, uh, John Fenn gave any molecule, whatever be its size, a pair of wings so it goes into the gas phase to make a measurement. Today it turns out that even in India, if you have money, you can buy a mass spectrometer. If you have a mass spectrometer, you can measure masses. The problem really starts after that. So you can see how important this technique is because once you discover this technique, the number of published articles using this technique went up very, very steeply. So I won't worry about this very much except to tell you that once you have all this information, you can build the structures of molecules. I want to show you a real example. This is an example from my own laboratory. Is that an important example? That's not why I'm showing it to you. I'm just showing it to you to tell you the power of the method. This is what microbiologists do in their laboratories. I am not a microbiologist. So this is a solid medium which will contain potatoes, carrots, agar, all mixed together. And on to this you will put a fungal culture and then the fun, this will just grow. When it grows, it will grow like this and put out these hyphae, all of them pointing like trees. You know, the interesting thing with mycology and the study of fungi is this, that some years ago in India, the study of fungi was with uh, botany department because they were closer to plants because eventually you see mushrooms and all sometimes. And nowadays this slowly be transferred to microbiology departments. So one has to be very careful uh, with university syllabi. I think one should never take them very seriously because the committees which make syllabi uh, don't worry about the uh, what one would call the common origins of biology. They are more worried about the fact whether the botany department was separate from the microbiology department or not and who should bear the teaching load for teaching uh, a, a given topic. So very, very mundane considerations actually determine syllabi uh, uh, in India, so I think one should not take them seriously at all. But if you now ask the question, what molecules are being produced there, which is producing that growing thing, all you have to do is to put a spoon in. Uh, if you come to a science laboratory, they will call a spoon a spatula. 
but uh, it's just a spoon. So you put a spoon in and take a little bit of that uh, white stuff out and put it onto a plate and hit it with a laser beam and some molecules will fly off into an astrophysics and you'll analyze it and you will then eventually end up uh, finding their structures. And it turns out that all these organisms produce large numbers of molecules. In fact, microbes, bacteria, fungi, they produce an enormous number of molecules which are called secondary metabolites. They are called secondary metabolites because they don't belong to that complicated chart which you could not read, which I showed you, which is primary metabolism. But you know, when the moment you say secondary metabolite, that means it probably has no function. And then you will ask the question, if it has no function, why does the organism spend so much of its energy making these molecules? Because you need to make these molecules with enzymes. You need to invest all the chemicals in order to make these molecules. And it turns out that biological organisms are very good businessmen. They look at the cost of investment and what will be produced at the end of it and whether it's going to be useful at all or not. These are the molecules which are used in what we call biological warfare. Because in an ecosystem when organisms fight for nutrients, you need to kill other organisms. And that is why the richest sources of antibiotics are from fungal cultures. Most of you can now go back and think about Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin, where he had a culture which was contaminated with a mold, and it was the mold which produced penicillin. So all the antibiotics, the erythromycin which was talked about, all of them are produced by these secondary metabolites. So you can study them. But there are all kinds of organisms which can be studied. A student came to my laboratory from Gujarat wanting to study this. These are the aerial roots of the banyan tree, if you look very carefully. Now the banyan tree and many of our trees around and their materials have very good medicinal properties. Now if you look at these, at the aerial roots, in the aerial roots there will be a bacterium which lives along with it. It is what is called an endophytic bacterium. The bacterium lives along with the banyan tree, helps the banyan tree, protects it from fungal attack. Because if you look carefully at trees, one of the most important problems that tree, trees have is fungal attack. And eventually when a tree dies, you know, sometimes the people who protest about trees believe that trees are immortal. The trees like us are also mortal, they have a certain lifespan, they are susceptible to disease uh, and they have natural mechanisms which allow them, which protect them. These are the natural mechanisms which produce antibiotics which protect the trees themselves. And those can all be studied by these methods and their structures established. So this then shows you that a diversity of molecules can in fact come from all of this. But if you look at a picture like this, each line that I show you might belong to a molecule because it is a measurement of mass. Therefore, the more the number of lines that you see, the more the number of molecules that, that can be characterized. So today, scientists have developed methodologies for separating molecules, which is called chromatography, and under each one of those peaks that you see, there may be dozens of molecules present. They can all be analyzed, and eventually one can, in fact, then the library of molecules. This is like a library which has not been classified. And if we deconvolute it, if we classify it, we are separating and classifying all the molecules. An analogy would be, if we started a new library and just ordered 10,000 books, it will come from the booksellers in no order whatsoever. And then if you start classifying them, you must know something about the books, you must know something about the subjects, and you must be able to classify them. What many people don't realize that the most fundamental advance in library classification was actually made by Dr. Ranganathan many, many years ago, who uh, was at the Indian Institute of Science in the 1930s and all, which is the Ranganathan classification a long time ago. But chemists are doing pretty much the same thing. Instead of classifying books, they are classifying molecules. In order to find out what, you have to find out what the molecule is and then classify it, and then find out what its use is. Eventually, what do we have to do? We have to read the molecule and find a use for it. Now, of course, I was talking about books. When you read a book, eventually you will find a use for it, because you learn something from it. If you don't read, you don't learn anything. So chemists follow the same thing in trying 
to unravel this diversity. But there are many ways in which nature makes molecules. This is a technical slide that I will just tell you. If you make molecules like proteins, you make it by gene encoded synthesis. The gene encoded synthesis takes place on an organelle called the ribosome. It is the structure determination of the ribosome for which Venki Ramakrishnan got the Nobel Prize three years ago. So it's a very important organelle where proteins are synthesized. But a lot of molecules which I showed you are not synthesized that way. They are synthesized by enzymes, which in turn are encoded by genes, but the enzymes now do the chemical reactions like a factory and produce the so-called secondary metabolites. So when we go back and look at the chemistry of natural products, remember that natural products are the materials or substances of nature. They are produced by microorganisms, they are produced by plants, and they are produced by animals. They are, they are differentiated in, in textbooks into primary metabolites and secondary metabolites. All the useful molecules that you know about, whether it is penicillin or erythromycin or tetracycline, they are secondary metabolites. The molecules that keep you going are primary metabolites. The molecules which organisms produce and plants produce which we use are secondary metabolites. But I found this quotation which I thought I would quote. What is secondary metabolism? If primary metabolism allows you to survive by keeping your biochemistry ticking, secondary metabolism represents the splendid idiosyncratic diversity of nature endowing different species with specific solutions to biological problems. Remember that he, every living organism encounters in its environment a set of problems which it must solve. The way it solves them is by evolving a chemical solution to the problem that it faces. I want to show you one example to which you will relate. I made this slide also only yesterday. This last year, an award called the Lasker Award was given to a Chinese scientist a lady called Tu Yu Yu. It was fascinating because she is now in her 80s, living in a single room apartment in Beijing, forgotten by everybody. Now the Lasker Committee, which is usually the precursor to a Nobel Prize, picked her up and gave her the Nobel, the Lasker Award for the discovery of a molecule called artemisinin. And this comes from the Chinese plant, Qing Hao Su. And she wrote an article last year in Nature Medicine, which is called The Discovery of Artemisinin, in Qing Hao Su, and Gifts from Chinese Medicine. There will be many gifts from Indian medicine, there will be many gifts from Af African medicine, which have still not been found. What was done here? In the 1960s, the Chinese were looking very hard for an uh, anti-malarial cure. Remember in the 1960s, the Vietnam War first had been fought with the French and then had been taken over by the Americans and long wars in tropical jungles where malaria was raging in Southeast Asia were in fact anticipated. Both the Americans and the Chinese were looking for anti-malarials. The Chinese went looking for anti-malarials by screening all plants in China they screened 2,500 plants with a biological assay in which they had in, infected mice with malaria and injected extracts to see whether the malarial parasite was cleared. They found some leads from this plant, but the leads were not reproducible. When it was not reproducible, what did they do? They went back and looked at these texts which are in Chinese. They come from 340 AD. They are written in the old script, and what this says is the handful of this plant emerges with 12 liters of water, wring out the juice, and drink it all. Now you read this sentence carefully. What does it tell you? Take plant material, put it in 2 liters of water, bring the juice out, and afterwards give it to the patient, and the patient improves from malaria. What would the chemist do? The chemist would take the plant, put it into a flask, put water into it, and chemistry, you know, all of you would have seen sometimes, even those who hate chemistry have this image of chemistry, because chemistry is the image of scientists in all the movies. There will be a flask with boiling things going on. So they will boil the water. 
First thing that is done is to make a decoction. So just like you make tea, they will boil you, everything will be boiled. When they boiled, they lost activity. And then when they went back and followed the 340 AD prescription, they found Atkinson. Then a structure was established. It turned out to be a structure unprecedented in natural forest chemistry. It is what is called a peroxide. And all of you know about peroxides. Hydrogen peroxide is there. The one characteristic of peroxides is they explode. That means this molecule will be extremely unstable. Even if it doesn't explode, it will decompose when you boil it. So the antimalarial activity was going away. So the ancient text provided a clue to the extraction of the chemical. So why I'm telling you this is that at various stages, knowledge of all kinds needs to be imparted in order for successful extraction of useful chemicals from natural sources. To tell you that what I've talked about is current, because I have one problem when I go as the director of the Indian Institute of Science to give popular lectures. The common rules of directors is that they long ago stop reading anything, and they are usually signing files or, uh, or doing something. And this is really to convince you that what I have tried to present to you is a real current interest. In last week's issue of one of the most important journals, the Journal of Science, there appeared this article called Plant Drugs of Most Economic Value. And this table appeared, and you will know some of the names, codeine, morphine, quinine, all of these, cocaine, and so forth. On the next slide, I simply put the structures. I put the structures just to tell you what kind of chemistry will fascinate chemists. There are all kinds of molecules here. Many of them you will know. Artemisinin, and which I told you about on the previous slide, is over here. This is not there in the paper, but I simply put the structures in by pulling the structures out. There was another figure in the paper in which structures were there, and I picked that up. And what these authors have written is, they have put this molecule in red. So I quickly went to their text to see why have they put this molecule in red, and they said it would be very nice to have this molecule. So I went back there and looked at the molecule and said, why don't you say it should be looked at the molecule? And I found this paper. This paper which appeared in Nature Chemistry just last year, it says synthesis of quinolidine, a potent non-opioid analgesic for chronic and persistent pain. In fact, one of the things for which molecules are being looked at is really for pain. There's a lot of pain in diseases like cancer which needs to be addressed with very powerful painkillers like morphine. The problem with morphine is that it is addictive. And therefore, one is looking, they are what are called opioid analgesics. So morphine comes from the opium poppy. A part of Afghanistan's problems is really, and the rock frontier of Pakistan, is really the fact that there is an enormous amount of opium cultivation. The rise of China itself can be traced back to the control of opium cultivation. But morphine, when you acetylate it, gives you heroin. And therefore it is a very dangerous problem. On the other hand, Conolidine would now be a non-opioid analgesic. It will come from uh, the stem and flowers of this plant. And therefore, it would be very, very interesting to look at this further. But how do plants make so many molecules? That is the question which scientists are asking today. And in this special issue of science, these are the questions which have been posed. It turns out that the enzymes which make them now are slightly modified. It turns out that the enzymes in plants are not very specific. Because they are not specific, they can take many molecules and react them, thereby generating diversity. How does biology work? For this we have to go back to what I would call the philosophy of biology, which was first enunciated by Darwin. Biology works by producing diversity, and selecting from this diversity organisms which will now fit and survive, propagate and reproduce in a given environment. It is the economists and the social engineers who have sort of used the phrase survival of the fittest, which is not the correct phrase to use for Darwinian natural selection. 
But how does this natural selection happen? Both the creation of diversity, biological diversity, and biological natural selection can only happen if there is diversity creation and selection also at the level of chemistry. And therefore, when one studies the diversity of chemistry in biology, one is in fact getting insights into the kind of diversity that one sees around you in, in nature. I hope I have tried to convey to you some feeling for the importance for studying diversity of chemistry in nature. Thank you very much.